Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. The words fast food conjure up a lot of different images in the minds of different people. For many of us, it's convenience or comfort. For others, it's the thought of our first job, or maybe even our current one. And for our more health-obsessed viewers, maybe the words are simply a turn-off altogether. However, one thing we don't tend to associate with the fast food industry is terrifying murder. The dark truth is that the industry has had an ongoing problem with daily violence for some time now, and these situations often put employees in danger. In 2019, the National Employment Law Project presented research showing that the media had reported on at least 700 incidents of violence occurring in the previous three years at McDonald's alone. And these were just the stories that made headlines. While most of these incidents involve irate customers or robberies of some sort, Sometimes, crimes targeting employees have been truly sinister, and have left a lasting mark on the public consciousness. Today, we wanted to take a look at a few examples of these kinds of stories, focusing on cases where fast food employees were the victims of chilling crimes. Before we get to today's video, we're excited to announce that Crime Zone's Patreon has been officially launched. If you are interested in supporting the channel and receiving Patreon-only exclusives, be sure to head there after the video. Patrons will receive ad-free versions of all of our content, weekly bonus cases for our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos, as well as other exciting extras. As always, a big thanks to everyone who has supported us so far. With that out of the way, here is part one of three terrifying crimes targeting fast food workers. On the night of January 8th, 1993, the parents of 16-year-old Michael Castro started to become concerned when he failed to return home from his part-time job in Palatine, Illinois. The teenager had been working the Friday evening shift at a local Brown's Chicken and Pasta, a popular fried chicken fast food chain based out of Chicago. Though Michael had been scheduled to work until 9 o'clock that night, it was now getting close to 11. His parents knew that it was unlike him not to call if he would be late, and finally decided that they would go down to the restaurant themselves to see what was going on. When they arrived, they found the Brown's Chicken location dimly lit with no signs of activity, the way it normally looked after closing up for the night. However, Michael's car was still in the parking lot, along with three others. Hoping that their son had gone out with some colleagues after work and had simply forgotten to call, they drove around to a couple of other local restaurants and tried to track him down. When this proved unsuccessful, they returned home and tried to nervously pass the time watching some TV, hoping their son would soon walk through the front door. By 11.45, the Castro's anxiety about their son's absence had become too much to bear, and they contacted the local police before driving back down to Brown's Chicken. To their surprise, when an officer arrived at the scene, he did not seem anywhere near as concerned as they were by the unusual situation. The Castros would later say that the officer drove around the building, and seeing no obvious signs of anything wrong, told them not to worry. He said that their son would come home soon, or that he would call. The officer reportedly never left his car. At the same time that this was happening, the family of another Brown's Chicken employee was also starting to grow concerned. Like Michael Castro, 46-year-old Guadalupe Maldonado had failed to return home after his evening shift, where he worked as one of the restaurant's cooks. He had only been employed at the fast food chain for 15 days, and had never returned home later than 10 p.m. When Guadalupe's wife Beatriz called the restaurant several times and received no answer, she sent his younger brother Pedro to investigate. By the time Pedro arrived at Brown's Chicken, it was close to 1.30 a.m. on Saturday. Like the Castros, Pedro found the restaurant dimly lit, with no sign of activity. When a police officer saw him peering through the windows of the building, he was asked to leave the property. Pedro explained the situation, but again was told by police not to worry. They said that his brother was probably just out drinking or hanging out. Though Pedro complied, he knew that this did not explain his brother's absence. For one thing, he did not drink, and for another, 
he never would have left his Dodge Charger in the parking lot of his workplace overnight. At 2 a.m., the Castros once again contacted local police, this time filing a formal missing persons report. After an officer arrived to fill out the report, he agreed to accompany the Castros to Brown's Chicken one final time to investigate. This time, the officer began checking the restaurant's doors after he arrived. He found that a single side door had been left unlocked. When the door was opened, Michael's father, who had been accompanying the officer, caught a glimpse of his son's jacket lying on a shelf. Realizing that they were likely at a crime scene, the officer told him to return to his car before he went further in to investigate. Within minutes, the parking lot of the fast food restaurant would be swarming with emergency service vehicles. Inside the restaurant's two walk-in refrigerators, police found the bodies of seven people. All of them had been shot or stabbed. Along with Michael Castro and Guadalupe Maldonado, the five other victims were the location's two owners, Richard and Lynn Ellenfeld, as well as three more employees, Rico Solis, Thomas Menes, and Marcus Nelson. A sum of between $1,800 and $1,900 had also been stolen from the restaurant. The brutal crime would come to be known as the Brown's Chicken Massacre. In the days and weeks following the terrifying murders, Owners and representatives of fast food chains all around Illinois tried to assure workers and the public at large that employee safety was a high priority. Because the motive of the crime appeared to be a robbery, particular attention was paid to the fact that the Brown's Chicken location did not have private security. Still, an attitude of panic quickly set in. This was exacerbated by what many felt was an inadequate and ineffective police response to the horrific crime. In the weeks and months that followed, Palatine Police Chief Jerry Bratcher, who had been put in charge of the case's task force, appeared to compensate by trying to project a confident public face about the state of the investigation. However, media reports seemed to tell a different story. Articles in local newspapers spoke of internal disputes within the investigation, saying that leaders of the task force had not given detectives adequate authority or resources to properly follow up on leads. On the third anniversary of the massacre, police held a press conference in an apparent attempt to reassure the public that progress was still being made in the case. In it, they stated that they believed the killings had likely taken place sometime shortly after the restaurant had closed after 9 o'clock, but before 10 p.m. They also said that they had discovered shoe prints at the crime scene, which they were hoping to link to the perpetrator and said that the killer or killers had removed all of the spent bullet casings after they had shot their victims. However, from there, the investigation stagnated. It wasn't until March of 2002 that police received information that blew the case wide open. A woman named Ann Lockett came forward and told investigators that her former boyfriend, James Degorski, was behind the Brown's Chicken Massacre and that he had committed the crime with another man named Juan Luna. Lockett claimed that she had held on to the information for so long because Degorski had threatened to kill her if she ever revealed the truth. Based on Lockett's information, investigators took a closer look at Degorski and Luna, who had been 20 and 18 years old respectively at the time the murders took place. Interestingly, Luna had been one of 300 former employees at the Brown's Chicken restaurant that had been questioned back in 1993. He had worked at the fast food location until just a few months prior to the grisly crime. A month after Lockett came forward with information, police got their next major break in the case, when DNA evidence taken from the crime scene came back as a match to Juan Luna. The evidence was from a piece of partially eaten chicken which had been taken from the garbage when the crime scene was first processed, and supposedly had Luna saliva on it. DNA techniques had not been sophisticated enough in 1993 to test the chicken, but the evidence had been saved for years in the hopes that it might one day aid in the investigation. A short time later, Luna was taken into custody, and police were able to obtain a confession. He would tell investigators that on the night of the massacre, he and Degorski had, quote, wanted to do something big. The men had allegedly bought a chicken dinner close to the restaurant's closing time, then proceeded to put on latex gloves and force the employees into the two walk-in refrigerators. After that, they had shot and stabbed the employees to death, 
before taking off with the restaurant's money. Following Luna's confession, both men were charged with seven counts of murder. Though police felt their case was ironclad, the defense teams for both Luna and Degorski seemingly had plenty to work with to discredit the charges against them. At Luna's trial in 2007 and Degorski's trial in 2009, lawyers for the men would attack the credibility of Ann Lockett, saying that she was an unreliable witness with a history of mental illness and drug use. They would also question the validity of the DNA evidence in the case, saying that it had been mishandled and that samples had been contaminated and were no longer reliable. Luna would also argue that his confession had been coerced and that he'd been physically assaulted by police officers during his questioning. In both trials, the prosecution fought back against all of these allegations, arguing that they had multiple swabs of the chicken that had produced the DNA match to Luna, and that Ann Lockett had told them information she had heard from Degorski that only the killer would have known. The jury ultimately decided in favor of the prosecution in both trials, finding Luna and Degorski each guilty of seven counts of murder. The men were ultimately spared the death penalty, though, and were each given life in prison. Though the crime has done immeasurable damage to the families and friends of the victims, it appears that they were not the only ones affected by the infamous Brown's Chicken Massacre. The restaurant itself saw declining sales in the months following the 1993 murders, and it appears that the fast food chain never quite recovered. Though it is impossible to say how much the restaurant's bad fortunes are directly related to the bad publicity it received, the once thriving chicken chain now seems to be in permanent decline. Over 100 locations were once scattered around Illinois and Indiana, but as of 2021, it seems that only 20 remain. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.